minister parked his car in no parking zone in a large city because he was short of time and couldn't find a space. So uh, uh, he put a note under the windshield wiper that read, I have circled this block 100 times. If I don't park here, I'll miss my appointment. And in big letters he wrote, forgive us our trespasses. When he got back, he found a citation from a police officer along with a note. I've circled this block for 10 years. If I don't give you a ticket, I'll lose my job. In big letters it said, lead us not into temptation. <laughs> I'm like a Christian police officer, but they'll get you. All right, I got another. My fan plug. Oh, no. A defense attorney was cross-examining a police officer during a felony trial. It went something like this. Officer, did you see my client fleeing the scene? No, sir, but I subsequently observed a person matching the description of the offender running several blocks away. Officer, who provided this description? And the policeman responded, the officer who responded to the scene. So, the lawyer said, so uh, a fellow officer provided the description of this so-called offender. Do you trust your fellow officers? The policeman said, yes, sir, with my life. And he said, with your life. Let me ask you then, officer, do you have a locker in the police station? A room where you change clothes and preparate for your daily duties? And uh, the officer said, yes, sir, we do. And do you have a locker in that room? Yes, sir, I do. And do you have a lock on your locker? And he said, yes, sir. He said, now why is it, officer, if you trust your fellow officers with your life, that you find it necessary to lock your locker in a room you share with those very same officers? And the policeman said, well, you see, sir, we share the building with the court complex, and every once in a while, lawyers will walk through the locker room. <laughs> Your Bible tonight, go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. We'll start there. Verse number one. The prophet writes this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I really like that last part. Amen. Uh, uh, to, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You know, there's a precious hymn in that hymnal, uh, written by uh, by Charles uh, Charles Wesley, and. Uh, and it's called And Can It Be. And uh, I read through that song. I mean, I got acquainted with it early on. And uh, the third verse, at least the way they're laid out in our hymnal at home, uh, the third verse talks about the dungeon uh, flamed with light. And I'm not meaning something to you. I got saved in a cell. Amen? The song goes on and says, My chains <laughs> fell off. My heart was free. And it was a dungeon where my chains fell off. That hits close to home and it's scriptural. Now, I believe the best place to get saved is in church. I mean, you know, or, or at your mother or father's bedside if you're a child and you can go to them and ask them to explain it to you, amen, and make God's timing. I, I fully believe that. I believe the best scenario, the best testimony is to give your heart and give your life to Jesus Christ way before the horrible pit and the miry clay. But I'm glad he'll still save you if you waited too long or too late. It says in there in the song, it can be, at my heart was free. It doesn't say body. Uh, uh, another song goes like this, and I like the old hymn, by the way. Uh, my sin not in part, but the whole. You know what I'm talking about. Is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. 
Uh, when my change fell off, I was still in a cell. I was still looking at going to prison. But I was free. I, I, I looked out, out of the bars, out on the third street, uh, uh, across the street, one way was they could take the second street, across the street, one way was the courthouse. And on the other side of the road was uh, lawyer offices and doctor buildings and all these professionals that I'm watching weekends and Mercedes and BMWs driving up down the road and people that thought they had this world by the tail. And I'm locked up and going to be locked up for a while. And I felt sorry, I'm honest to God, I felt sorry for them people because I had just been set free. Amen. Amen. You know, it said there in our text, it's to proclaim liberty to the captives. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about liberty to the captives. But tonight, I'll title this the jailbreak, and we'll go to Acts 12. Acts chapter 12. I am glad that the Lord Jesus Christ sets us free. Amen. 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 Alright, verse number one. Acts chapter 12. Let's pray. Father, I love you and I pray you help me preach. Lord, I don't know everybody here tonight, but I I know this. If there's somebody in here that's not saved, they need to get saved. I pray you make it easy for them to understand that. And I pray that perhaps for a few minutes we can put the distractions of this world on hold on the back burner. I know that's easier said than done, but I pray the Spirit of God will just cut through all the junk and, uh, and uh, I'll shine the glorious light of the gospel of Christ on the heart that needs it the most tonight. Help us, Lord God, to say what you have said so that you can do what only you can do. Well, thank you for that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. All right, Acts chapter 12 here, verse number 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, it said there in verse 2, he killed James, the brother of John. James, James was one of the original four that were called out in Matthew chapter 4. He had Andrew and Peter, and then they were fishermen, and then their fellow fishermen, was, uh, was uh, James and John. They're referred to as the sons of Zebedee, their brothers. This is John that wrote the book of John, wrote the book of Revelation. This is his brother, and Herod has killed him with a sword. You say, what does that mean? He cut his head off. That's how he did. That's maximum effect. This is the James that left his career, left his family, and left his religion, and followed Jesus, responded to the Lord's call. Uh, follow me and I will make thee fishers of men. You say, well, that doesn't seem fair. He got killed. He stepped in the glory before his head hit the ground. See, we look at everything on the temporal. We look at everything through the eyes of flesh. So it pleased the Jews. Listen, these Jews are under so much conviction because they just crucified Christ not long before. They're, they're grasping at straws. Amen. They want to convince themselves. Stephen Ben Stone, they want to convince themselves they did the right thing. And uh, they're getting swept up into a frenzy again. And uh, Herod getting in on it because he's a stinking politician. And he saw that this is making people excited. You know what politicians do? Whatever makes people excited. And thank God once in a while somebody comes along that's not talking out of both sides of their mouth because most of them are. We clear on that? Amen. So here we got James and he killed him and the Jews liked him, verse 3, so he had Peter arrested. But it's, uh, it's uh, during the feast days. So he just locked him up. And verse 4 says, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. The Easter that Herod is, is, is celebrating here is not what you think. It's an extremely pagan holiday dedicated to the God of heaven. Her name was Ishtar. 
Alright? Don't confuse the Jewish uh, uh, holiday and uh, holy day and Easter, even though you see it written there. And uh, so he intended to bring him forth. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without teaching of the church for him. Verse 6, when Peter would have, and when, sorry, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers the keepers before the door kept the prison. Let, let's jump in here somewhere. Let's jump in here at verse number 6. And I will call point number 1 Peter's restraint. I want you to notice what's going on here and I'll read the verse again. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night Peter was sleeping. He's locked up uh, his friend, old time friend from before they were followers of Christ, old time co worker, going back a ways, another guy that had committed to follow the Lord. He just seen him executed, or he knows of it, and he's been arrested. He's looking at the same thing, and he's sleeping between two soldiers, notice, bound with two chains. Not one, two. Two chains, and the keepers of the prison, the keepers before the door kept the prison. <laughs> like, you know, they weren't sure if one chain could hold this guy down. Uh, two chains. It, and, I mean, they were literal. I mean, they were literal bondage. It says in Mark chapter 5 about uh, the maniac of Dara, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been broken asunder. Fine. So when we're talking about Peter's restraint, Peter is locked up. He's on hold, waiting for this holy day to pass. So that and, and he, they intend to execute him, and he is in a prison. He's not just in a cell. He's between two soldiers, and he's got two chains on. They're worried about something. <laughs> when I uh, when I got arrested, and I was kind of crazy there at first, and then I got saved. And uh, I had Bell's palsy just before I got uh, arrested back in 1990. And they took me to Miami Valley Hospital with, uh, to have an MRI done. And I recently got saved, uh, much calmer, and I didn't even care. I'm shackled, leg shackled, belly band with handcuffs, and I'm scooting through this hospital, and I'm a big high-profile federal uh, uh, prisoner, and so I got U.S. Marshals escorting me, and then as soon as we get to the hospital, they pull the door, and hospital security is going crazy, and, uh, and you know, they're blocking it, because they're on their phone, they're having a big professional day. And uh, so they're escorting me through the corridor to where the MRIs are. And so here I am, and I don't care, I'm talking to people, I'm saying, well, I've been saved about a week, and uh, none of this stuff faces me anymore. I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. I'd written my mother a letter. I mean, I'm, I'm in a good mood. I'm out of the jail. We're driving around town. You know, I'm going, oh, cool. And then we're being escorted through the hospital with all these chains, and we get into the MRI room. We get in the MRI room, and uh, there's a big sign on the wall. No jewelry. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what, I start shaking them, them uh, handcuffs and that chain at them marshals, and they look at each other and they drug because they got to take them off. I mean, them hospital guys, them hospital security, they're freaking out now. They're calling them in extra help, you know, like here I am, you know, in a, in a, in a workhouse uniform, standing in this hospital with about, you know, four young marshals, about a, a eight or nine hospital guys, and they got to take their handcuffs off. It was funny. It was funny. But we're talking about literal physical bondage. But I want to tell you something tonight, folks. There's another kind of bondage that's as every bit as real as this physical change. Okay? And it says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Everywhere you go, uh, you'll see people, they don't realize it, but they're bound by the change of their sin. Some, for some it's lust, for others greed, covetousness, envy, pride, bitterness, all kinds of perverse stuff these days, and they're bound up in it, man, they can't see, 
uh, they, can't, they can't see the forest for the trees. They're bound by the chains of their sin. But I, listen, it's sad to me as I travel around the number of Christians that are also bound by the chains. They're saved. I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the life, they're going to end up in heaven if they truly trust in Christ. But man, everywhere I go, uh, that. I see Christians that are prisoners to their flesh, prisoners to this world, prisoners to their mind. This is the day and age where instead of looking and see what the Bible says, people you try to have a conversation with a Christian and they say, well, I think that's the problem. See. You're more interested in what you think or how you see it than what that book says. Amen. This is, the, this is the church age of people hung up on themselves 2,000 years after Calvary. I am rich and a great of good and I need of nothing. Nothing, huh? Don't, don't need church. Don't need to be faithful. Don't need to give. Don't need to read the Bible. Don't need to pray. You got it. You got a handle on it. But I'm going to tell you something. That's bondage of the stinking devil and a lot of Christians that have, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't guess they did it in purpose, on purpose, but maybe their lack of relationship with the Word of God and their sensitivity to the Holy Spirit allowed them to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And I'm here to tell you tonight that's possible because Paul warned us not to let it happen. Because it can happen and it does happen. Galatians 4 and verse 9, Paul wrote this, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather have known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Paul could not comprehend why anybody in their right mind would do that. That's what he's saying. And I love it. I, I can't eat. Amen. Uh, maybe being locked up was good for me. I understand what bondage is. I understand. You know, Peter, we find him in, in Peter's restraint. We find him here. He was bound. He was bound with two chains. But if you're saving there, you're not supposed to be. You're not supposed to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Bible says in John 8 and 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right, so number one there is Peter's restraint. He's bound, he's locked down, he's under heavy guard, and he's locked in a prison, and then he's bound with two chains. Number two tonight will be in verse six again. Uh, we'll go back up where it says Peter was sleeping. He wasn't just between two thorns, he was asleep. Number two would be Peter's repose. Peter's repose. Uh, maybe he just figured he needed to get rested up. He had a big day coming. He had a big day coming as soon as that feast was over. Amen. It was his turn. So here he is in prison in big trouble. I mean, he's not hoping for a break, man. He knows what's going to happen. And he, this is how worried he is about it. He's not like a normal Christian. He's asleep. But amen. That's not as easy as it might sound. Jail's a noisy place. Dark barking orders, prisoners yelling all over each other, doors banging and clanging, loud, loud speakers blaring. It, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy place to sleep. I know it is, and I think Peter's come a, whole, a long way from that storm and sea in Mark chapter 4. Amen. We woke the Lord up and said, Care not that we perish. I thought it was interesting that the Lord used Peter to give us 1 Peter 5 7 that says, uh, Casting all, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Amen. Peter's not, he's matured some. Since Mark chapter 4. He's in this trial and he's the one that's sleeping. It's amazing what a person can get used to. This place where he was and they still are. Ungodly, intimidating, often violent place. Uh, I tell you, I'm glad I wasn't a kid when I got locked up. 
I was in and out of little deals off and on. But uh, when I got when I got nailed on the federal dope and weapon charges, I was uh, almost 38 years old, and uh, I was a man, and I didn't have a good attitude, and nobody messed with me, and I, and I wish they would. But I've been back in the jail ministry uh, right after I got saved, years so after I got saved, and through the years, I've seen young guys, tough guys, know everything, 18, 19, 20, 25. Got a handle on everything. Get ready to go to penitentiary. And buddy, I tell you what, I think you have no idea what you're getting into. And I feel sorry for them. I'm not saying they don't deserve to go for some of the things they're dead. But it's it's a horrible place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something else that blows my mind. It's amazing to me the extent of ungodliness that the Church of Jesus Christ has gotten used to in the last 2,000 years. You know why that is? I'm going to tell you why that is. The Bible tells us it's going to happen. Christians have been lulled to sleep by comfort, by compromise, and by complacency. And I'm just going to tell you, because I, they don't want to be woke up. They don't want to be woke up. They don't want they don't want loud preaching. Mm -hmm. right. They want to come to a church and have everybody just, you know, sing a few songs and share a little love. And I tell you what, man, you're going to have to come to the understanding that we are hell bound, hell deserving sinners to even begin to comprehend what I preach Sunday morning. Jesus Christ had to go to the cross to make a way for our sins to be forgiven. Amen. It's amazing. People don't want to be stirred. They don't want to be. Uh, uh, the step like preachers almost preach apologetically. Uh, I, I hate to have to say this. I don't. Because I'm trying to help you. And I understand I'm preaching almost always to save people. Amen. But every one of us knows somebody that's lost. We need to be stirred up. We need to get out of our comfort zone. We need to take this thing more seriously. Wow. Because we're the ones that are getting lulled to sleep by the stinking devices of the devil and, it, and, and all the stuff that's going on in the devil's world. And we, we've gotten secure and we're going to go to heaven when we die. And, and we've gotten victory over some things and there's some other things we don't do. So we're good. Not good. Because we ought to want to be used of God and where. We're not interested in being a vessel made for the masters used like we should be. And I understand, here's where I got to throw out the disclaimer. I'm not talking to everybody, but if I'm talking to you, I'm trying to help you. You understand the difference? People are thin skinned. That book says, A great peace uh, have they which love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. When I was in the motorcycle gang, we could, we could get mad at each other, fist fight, and then shake it off and go back in. Christian boy, you make a Christian. You, you offend a Christian, you, you make an enemy for life. They'll talk about you behind your back. They'll go on to stinking social media and rail on you, knowing that they've got lost people on there that are going, look at those people. They ain't no different than we are. Shame on me. Right. Right. Shame on you if you're doing it. <laughs> Amen. Bible says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake! Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. And some of them are your relatives. And some of them are your friends. And some of them are your cohort workers. And if you and I don't awake to righteousness, you know what he says? I speak this to your shame. Definitely Tuesday night, feel good about yourself tonight. Here's what I'm saying, and I'll move on. Time for God's people to wake up. Right? Alright, so you got Peter's uh, restraint. Two chains. Seriously. <coughs> this guy's bound up. <laughs> I know Christians that are in worse shape than he is. 
They can't even sleep because they, they're so bound in sin. The wheels are turning. They ain't turning when it comes to things of God. Peter's reality. Verse number four again. Number three, Peter's reality. I gotta tell you, he's locked up, but he's not, he's not just in prison. He's on death row. He's on death row, verse number four again. It says, and when he had apprehended him, hear it, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. To bring him forth to the people, not for trial. Peter's not sitting there, you know why he's sleeping? Why not? He's not fretting about uh, his lawyer doing a good job or not. He's not worrying about any surprise witnesses. He, he's not hoping for a sympathetic jury. Uh, he, he's not even, uh, it doesn't even cross his mind what kind of mood the judge is going to be in. Preachers think of all those things. Not Peter, not Peter. This isn't a trial, this is about sentencing. <laughs> this is about his execution. Right after the Easter egg hunt, Herod can cut off his head, just like he did James. Peter's reality is that the next day, if we find him bound, we find him sleeping with him, the next day he's going to be killed. You know, in this world, you got two kinds of people. Two kinds, just two. Two kinds of people. you got saved people, and you got unsaved people. In spite of, I mean, we're individuals and we have many differences, but in spite of all the differences, every human being's got at least two things in common. Number one, the Bible says all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. Ground level at the cross. If you're in here tonight, let me be the one to tell you, you're a sinner. And people say, well, who? That's not very nice. Really? Paul said, am I therefore your enemy because I tell you the truth? What you, the Bible says faith will not a wounds wound of a friend, but the kiss of an enemy are deceitful. You better be careful anybody, especially a, a charlatan that'll get in the pulpit and, and, and tell you what you want to hear. You better hope somebody will tell you the truth. Right. Yeah. The Bible says all of sin to come short of the glory of God and the way to sin is death. I buried 41 of my own guys when I rode with the outlaw. The international president that has been in the penitentiary for the last 20 years died Sunday morning. He was one of my best friends. He put a contract on my life when I became a Christian because he was worried that I'd rat him out. I didn't become a rat, I became a child of God. And for five years, I've been writing to him in federal prison trying to win him to the Lord. And the Lord would let us become friends again. And I prayed for him and his family. And as far as I know, he's in hell right now. And they're communicating with me. Uh, some of the old club members telling me about the funeral. They say, are you going to go? Am I going to go? I am preaching a revival in South Carolina when that's going on. This is my life. All of sin has come short of the glory of God and the way to sin is death. And everybody's got that in common. I've got people tell me the only difference between you and me is you got caught. I got news for you. Everybody's caught. Right. Yeah. I mean, you might get away with something, you know, you don't get arrested, but everybody's caught. We're all felons. Some are convicted, some aren't. Amen. It's all saying to God, by the way. Each pair is just. And we got out, we got that in common, we're all sinners, we got something else in common. Everybody's going to die. Yeah. Bible says it's appointed on a man once to die. And we always have an appointment with death. For some of us, it's going to be the first appointment we weren't late for. Saved people, unsaved people, healthy people, sick people, rich people, poor people. Everybody's got an appointment with death. Here's why. Romans 5 and 12 says this. We're afraid by one man. That be Adam. Sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. For that all that sin. Amen. You got it. 
You got a sin nature from Adam, all right, but don't worry, you've been added to it since you came out of home speaking lies. Those precious little babies, yeah, yeah, they're little liars. I'm in Victoria, I can't even imagine. She looks so nice and sweet. But all the rest of us, I'm kidding. <laughs> you figure out what part of kidding. Right. Peter's reality and your reality is very similar. Yeah. The difference between him and me, him and you, is he knew when Israel was coming. It was going to be the next morning. <laughs> you and I don't know. Preacher said it right. It can be. Uh, we're talking. I ain't listening. The trumpet can blow any minute. But hey, I think your heart could too. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what a day may bring. I just came to Panama City. I told you about it the other night. Those people have been through hurricanes. That pastor there had been through nine or twelve, something like that, hurricanes. Been there sixty years. Some been worse than others. All right. At 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 I don't know, ten o'clock at night. Hurricane Michael off the shore gonna hit land category two. And within an hour, hour and a half, that thing kicked up to a four, almost a five. And I uh, place. And many lives changed forever. He called me uh, two days ago and he said that Hurricane Ivan, whatever that was, up there by Pensacola, in 50 counties, the cleanup produced 1.7 million cubic yards of debris. In 50 counties. And Hurricane Michael in Bay County alone in four months 25 million cubic yards of waste and they and they ain't half done. Right. Boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Right. <laughs> I'll tell you what it, I'll tell you what a target is going to bring forth it's going to bring forth Heaven or hell, just two choices. And it all hinges on what you do with Jesus Christ. So you got Peter's restraint, and uh, there's a restraint more serious than physical chains that people are bound up in, and Christians can be too, and many are. But then you got Peter's repose. He had peace. He had peace in that trial. You can have peace in your trial too. Unless your bondage is of your own making. Then you'll have no peace until you get the thing fixed. Amen. Uh, uh, Peter's reality was that he was going to die, and so is yours. Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man so that shall else will read. So if you're playing around, listen, God be merciful, but I hope you don't let your heart deceive you into thinking that you're getting away with sin because. He's not going to, it can't happen. God is not mocked. Payday's around the corner. The only thing that'll stop it is the mercy of God. Yes. And you can get in on the mercy of God. And I'm serving you notice tonight that you need to. You better. Amen. Last of all, you got Peter's rescue. Peter's rescue. See, it's going to end on a happy note. For Peter, whether it does for you or not, I don't know. That depends on what you do. But you got Peter in pretty dire straits, would you agree? And as dire as the situation appears, he had an ace up his sleeve. Verse number five again. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without the ceasing of the church uh, unto God. For him, yeah, they didn't. Uh, the, the the church, they didn't. Uh, they didn't call CLA. They weren't googling, you know, what to do. They were on their face before God. You know, they're better off than we are. They didn't have all the resources we have. They just had to trust God. What we can ever get back to that? I wonder. Amen. So it says in verse seven, and behold. And pray. Remember, they prayed. Verse five. 
the church, a, a prayer was made without teaching of the church under God, 4 Peter, verse 7, and behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he, the angel, smote Peter on the side, uh, he said, wake up, he said, uh, and raised him up, saying, arise up quickly. And uh, look what it says, I love it. And his chains fell from his hand. Chains, both of them. Both of them. Amen. They fell off. Like the song. Like the song. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Make perfect sense to me. Right. Amen. I got saved in jail. I missed the church service since. I don't get maybe three or four and 28 years because I wasn't feeling good and just didn't want to infect everybody else. Surrendered my life uh, about six months after I got saved. Surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I'm old fashioned altar. Four months later, got called to preach in a rescue mission. Got sentenced to probation instead of going to prison. Went to Bible school. Been full time for 22 years. Hey, when your chains fell off, fall off, that's the only thing that makes sense. Right. You follow the one that said you're free. Again, maybe I've got an advantage. Maybe I knew what kind of trouble I was in. And that's why this thing's so real. Now, my flesh don't like it any more than anybody else. There's a lot of things I'd rather be doing. Amen? But I know who it is that'd rather be doing it. When the flesh is lusted against the spirit, what you need to do is learn to identify who it is, who it is that wants to lay out of church, who it is that wants to, well, I can go down a whole long list. But you need to understand, is this the, you, why don't you ask God about it? Is this, is this the spirit of God, or is this the flesh? And you'll get an answer. You really will. Because the spirit of God will bear witness to what's right. But the flesh, a loud shout, the still small voice of God, if you let it. This is good preaching. I'm going to record it. I didn't have any of this written down. It says in verse 8, and the angel said unto him, Now first, the angel said, Rise up quickly. And the Bible said, Change them up. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And look at the next four words. And so he did. And he said unto him, there's the angel again, and he said unto him, cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. Look at verse 7 and 9. Verse 9. And he went out and followed him. I tell you what, it's a good thing he got out there too, because those guards, he is between two guards, and they are not going to be happy when they wake up, and their prisoners are gone. My thinking, I'm wondering if, if they were chained together, when it was over. You know, his rescue was successful because the angel of the Lord told Peter what to do. And then Peter did it. It wasn't magic. Amen? It was as simple as the angel of the Lord saying, you do this. Peter did it. What he was told, he was rescued. <laughs> he could have just sat there like some Christian just said, well, but the angel said, come on. And, you, and, and he could have said, well, wait, I, I'm, I'm going to change here. And, and the soldiers might wake up. And, and, the, and the gates are locked. There's no way. That's what people do. The Bible says there's a way. And there's a truth. There's a life. No man can be thought about my man. And we say, yeah, but instead of doing what God said, some people are too smart for their own good. I didn't know nothing, man. My life was destroyed. And I went, okay. All right, I'm going to do it your way. <laughs> I wish I'd have started that about 20 years earlier. Amen. Peter didn't give all the excuses that he could have. I see that he could have. He just did what the angel of the Lord said. From the prison house, Death row of sin, rescue still will. And it's the same way. It's he, the word of God. He, the word of God, said. So, if you need to be rescued from complacency or compromise, and the temptation is there for all of us. It says in Hebrews 12, 1, let us lay aside, lay aside, 
every weight and the sin would touch so easily beset us. You know, beset means surround, enclose, him in, besiege, entangle. The sin that entangles us. No man the Lord is entangling himself in the affairs of this life. That he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. Some are saying I'm a Christian soldiers. We don't even have a clue <laughs> what it's like to be a soldier. And I'm not talking because you're not a veteran. I'm talking about because you're entangled in the affairs of this life and you don't even realize it. You can be rescued too. He tells you how. Lay it aside. Lay it aside. Whatever it is that's weighing you down. Whatever distraction that keeps you from running your race. Whatever it is that keeps you from your potential for Christ. Lay it aside. You ever wonder how God would take an old a drunkard, dope addict, professional criminal, put me in the ministry, put me in the ministry, bless my socks off over 20 years, looking at my schedule, booking meetings up in, in three and four years in advance. And I think, God, there's a lot of people that are more intelligent, got a better testimony, a lot smarter, no more Bible. Why aren't you using them? It's a good question. Some of them got the capability of making too much money otherwise. That's keeping some better qualified people than me from serving God. Smarter people than me. Some of them just got hung up. Some just get hung up on the cares of this life and don't even understand that they're in bondage. And I'm here to tell you passage shows us that there is still liberty to be proclaimed to the captives. You can get freed up from whatever it is that's got you bound up. If you want. You can. It's your call. So what do you do? Why don't you just get honest with God? Say, God, show me. Uh, my Bible teacher early on told me, uh, as a young Christian, and I, you know, talk about taking things one step at a time. And we got to the point, he said, Brother Dave, he said, and I had a ponytail, and I got all this. He said, Brother Dave, and when I got ready, he said, just try this. Just go into your house, go into one room, just pick a room. <coughs> And get in the floor, middle of the room, and say, God, would you please show me anything in here that's hindering your spirit, my growth, affecting my testimony negatively? If we look at our whole life and go, man, this is overwhelming. I'm glad Lord didn't look at Calvary like that. That whole scenario, leaving heaven, I mean, that seems kind of overwhelming to me. But he said, just ask the Lord to show you, and I did that. And there were things that needed to go. And sometimes things aren't even inherently wicked. See, you want a list of do's and don'ts. Well, that's what religion will give. But a personal relationship with Jesus Christ goes like this. You ask the Lord... And you be sensitive to his spirit, he'll answer you. And little by little, things started falling off. Now don't worry, after 20 years, every time I get the list cleared, he gives me a new list. I mean, we got, <laughs> we got a long way to go. But you ought to want to draw an eye to God so that you're not a captain. Man, I'm an American. We love freedom. I'm going to tell you what all the people that rail on our country, most of them have never been to another country. Europeans don't have a, a fractionally the freedom that Americans have. Right. Canadians do not have fractionally have the freedom that the average American has. Right. And they don't know it. But I've been out enough, I know. I like freedom. And after being born in this country, and, and enjoying the liberties that we have that many countries don't have anything close to. 
and, and then to find out that there's freedom from sin, and man, I'll tell you what, when I got a hold of that, and I wish I could say I've never made mistakes since I've been saved, but I'd be lying. And then, but I'll tell you what, it's worth, it's worth doing whatever is necessary to get the relationship restored with God, so that the peace of God can rule in your heart. There's still, what, here's what I'm saying, I'm just, I'll just stop. There's liberty to be had for a child of God that this world doesn't comprehend. Personally, I'm a fan of the old-fashioned altar call. It was a place I visited if I even thought the Holy Spirit was dealing with me. And he dealt with me a lot. And I didn't worry about what other people thought when I was lost. I'm not going to worry about it. I, you do it your way. But this ain't perfect. You better do it God's way. You figure that out, what that is. I'm not giving you rules. I'm telling you, you better get with God if you want the jailbreak. And I'm talking about tonight. Maybe you're in there tonight and you're not saved. To save, be saved, it says, he said in Hebrews 2, how shall we escape if we neglect some great salvation? The answer is easy. You won't escape. Escape what? Lake of fire. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life is cast into a lake of fire. There will be no sin in heaven. Not even your little ones. Say, well, I'm not a mass murderer. I'm not a dope, dope head, dope dealer, whatever. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. But those little tiny sins that you don't think nothing about, God does. And they're not going to get in. And you're not going to get in until you get them forgiven. And that's what salvation is. And if you're in here tonight and you're not saved, you need to be, you can be, how? Just like Peter got out of jail. Do what the Lord says. I said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. Man, that means me. That means you. I tried it. I put that to the test. I didn't, I didn't come in and God would let a wretch like me <clears throat> have forgiveness. But if I said, that, whoa, I said, whoa, it'd be kind of dumb to go to hell with the price of pay. I got saved. Now, how about you? Are you saved? You're near night and you're not. You're near night and you don't know where you spend eternity. God will let me open my Bible and answer any question you have. I don't ask me about Eskimos. Don't ask me about dinosaurs. I'm talking about your soul. And I can show you in five minutes how you can know where your soul is going to spend eternity. And then you make the choice. If you don't want no part of it, you better have fun between now and your last breath. You're going to have no fun after that. That's your call. I'm not putting nothing on nobody. Do what you want. But I sure would like to show you what your options are so you can make an intelligent choice. That's all standing. Christian, you heard the message. So.